Good afternoon. Uh, last last session of the day. It's been quite a long one. So, uh, um, my first slide actually doesn't look like there's anything interesting, but there's actually quite a lot to explain about on this one. First of all, I'm Richard Smith. I've met most of you, but if you haven't, um, I'm development manager at Dialog, but I do real work as well, and it's mainly the component file system, and that's what I'm talking about. Uh, file system enhancements I'm talking about. Now, specifically, the files built into the interpreter, the component files. Uh, tomorrow, Morton will be talking about the Dialog file server. That's not something for today. And the other thing to mention is version 14. Uh, I can't talk about version 14, really, without talking about what we've done up to version 14. And I've been asked to, uh, to assume that some people here are not already on 13.2. They're not using the latest and greatest, and they want to know what we've done in the last few years anyway. So I'm actually going to be talking about 10.1, 12.0, 12.1, 13.0, and 14.0, and in the future as well. So <laughs> let's see how we go with that. Um, Oh, nothing interesting happened then. <laughs> Actually, it did. I think there are some references to 11 in here. Good. OK, so the first thing I want to talk about is large span files. Now, I hope, I hope for most people that's, that's an, a non-issue. We're all using them. Sometimes they're called 64-bit files, but we prefer the term large span because there's no connection between 64-bit files and the 64-bit interpreter. Uh, the 32-bit interpreter can use 64-bit files and vice versa. Um, but they increase within the uh, file, all the, all the offsets within the file and the pointers, so that you can get much larger components. Um, uh, sorry, that the file itself can be much larger. Uh, they can exceed the four gigabyte limit. And they were introduced in 2004, so they've been with us for, for nine years now, 10 years when we release 14.0. Uh, um, they give you large components, they give you interoperability improvements. Uh, you can write Unicode data to them. Um, and specifically, you can, uh, you can mix AIX and Windows and Linux clients, and they can all read the file, they can all access the file, they can all update the file, and they all work just fine. That is not true with the old-style 32-bit files. Uh, they become read-only if you didn't create the file and you have a different file architecture. So when we introduced them in 10.1, uh, they weren't the default creation mode. Now, you might think that would have been a good idea, but the problem would have been that older versions of the interpreter wouldn't have been able to use them. So we were rather tied in what we can do. So at, at the time we released 10.1, you still got small span files by default, and then 10.0 and earlier versions were fine with them. And you had to explicitly say you wanted large span files by putting a 64 on the quad F create. And, and although the file could be big, the individual components were still limited to a maximum of 4 gig. So we extended those slightly. In 12.0, they then became the default creation mode. You would get those if you didn't explicitly ask for anything else. If you wanted small span, you actually had to explicitly say 32 on Quad F Create or set up some command line options. Um, and at that time, we added Unicode support because that's when it came with the product. And we still had no large individual components. And finally, in 13.1, large individual components came along with the general support we did for large arrays. In 13.0, in 2011, we, we officially announced that small span component files were no longer um, to be supported uh, other than in reading from version 14 onwards. And version 14 onwards is now very much upon us. So I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Now, another bit of uh, major work we did was journaling. Uh, in 12.0, we added what we're now calling journaling level one. This was all John Scholes's work. What it does is it changes the way that we update a component file. It, uh, um, it does it in such a way that if the, if the update gets interrupted, uh, the next f uh, user to access the file can automatically uh, recover the file. If they didn't do that, uh, it would be broken. And f uh, f file damage was a problem that we had many times before we introduced that. It goes most of the way to preventing that happening. Any damage is automatically corrected by the next user of the file without any knowledge to the user that it's happened. Um, but again, uh, as in large, uh, large and small components, um, by default we had to leave it switched off because otherwise there would be no compatibility with earlier versions of the interpreter. 
but you could switch it on with the Quad F props. And in the next release, uh, we added additional journaling levels that gave greater protection, particularly in the case of uh, the operating system keeling over. Um, and we added checksumming, which adds more security and allows us to automatically repair files. Now, I've shot through that very quickly but, um, because I've spoken about this many times before. And um, if you want to know more about this, I've put on the conference website a paper that I did from a previous conference. And there's more in there. But of course, I will take questions. In 13.1, we changed the default creation mode to J1C1. In other words, we put on journaling, we put on checksumming. That means that 11. whatever cannot read files created by 12.1, but you can always switch the journaling off, the checksumming off, and you can get back to them. Next thing we did was data compatibility. Now, what I mean by that is um, a problem that you might encounter with a component file. If you have a workspace, created in, say, 13.1, you can't read it in 13.0 because that workspace contains data which is unsafe or potentially unsafe in that environment. Um, it's just full of binary data which that earlier version may not be able to cope with well. Um, with components, however, you've always been able to read those components that were written by a later version of the interpreter. And that's, that's usually convenient, but it's also very dangerous. So we've always suggested people don't do that. Um, what might happen? Well, if you read a component from a component file, of, there I go, reading component 1 into D, uh, then it, completely independently of that, so ask for the value of 1 plus 2, and something strange happens. Uh, that strange may be a 7, it may be a, a sys error. You've no idea why that's happened, and ultimately it's because that read some data into the workspace that corrupted the workspace. So. There are certain components, types, data, that, that you don't want to be doing that with. And as of 13.1, if there is da da data which we consider to be dangerous, we won't let you read it. Um, and we give you a domain error and tell you that it's from a later version of APL. This is not regular data. This is not um, anything simple like characters, um, anything mixed. It is namespaces. It's quad R ORs of functions, things that really could cause a problem in those versions of the interpreter. And the final thing prior to 14.0 I quickly wanted to tell you about uh, is extended error reporting, uh, quad DMX. Particularly useful, I think, for component files um, because here we've got an example. I've tried to uh, tie a file. It says file name error. I have absolutely no idea why that happened. Um, there's many situations that could have caused that to happen. Well, as of 13.1, it tells you. Uh, in this case, it couldn't open the file because the network path was not found. In other words, I referred to something on the network. It wasn't there. So that gives us more information. And then typing quad DMX will give me further information still. OK, good. So that was a bit of a run through as an introduction to what we're going to do on version 14. So the first thing we've got is we've added variant supports to a fair number of the component file functions. Um, I don't know if people are very familiar with variant. Uh, we've used it in the past on uh, the Quad R and Quad S system operators. Uh, it's a way of well, it's a way of giving options, but what it really does is define um, another version of a function which has slightly different default properties. Um, for example, quadf create ordinarily uh, creates a file with journaling and checksumming set to level one. Well, I can create a variant of that which, which gives a file with a default uh, variant, uh, journaling level three. Um, at the moment, without that, I would have to explicitly set use quad f props after creating the file in order to do that. In version 14, you'll be able to do it in one step. And not only is that convenient, it's, it also uh, avoids a complete conversion of the internals of the file, which is um, what happens in the first example. I've given two examples there uh, to show that um, in the first example, you've got uh, you're specifying that the journaling level is three, but you don't have to uh, say the journaling level. By default, it assumes if you only give a value, it's the journaling level. So you've got that simple variant three, and you get a J3C1 
component file. Um, we've put a, another variant on tie. Uh, you'll see why predominantly in a moment, but we can, we can say when we tie a file we want it to be read-only. Um, and if you do that, uh, when you try and write to the file, it will tell you that it is a read-only file and it won't let you. That doesn't actually stop writes happening to the file. Um, because, for, for example, recovering a journal that might have happened to have been in there will still happen. Um, but it's, it's a, a way of preventing ups access to the file without using the um, access matrix. But as I say, the main reason for that will become clear in a moment. And also we've added variant to quad f -chuk, and, and that's basically just to square the circle because um, at the moment it takes options as a character vector on the left argument, which isn't really consistent with everything else. So there are variant options that you can use with it now. You can say repair one, saying I want it to repair a file if it finds damage. Or again, one on its own implies repair, and it will just, recover, it'll just re repair the file if it needs it. But uh, I personally find that syntax, in this case, less convenient. So the old form does still work. You can use either. So I wanted to return to small span files. We've talked about how great large span files were. Um, but small span files don't have the things I talked about. They have restricted functionality. And particularly, they, they, sp they take a lot of my development time. And <laughs> I want to be giving uh, some other stuff. And some of the other stuff that you will see is only possible because of our plan to um, eventually phase out uh, small span files completely. I hope that there's very few people still using them because the large span files have been around for so long. But I suspect that, um, that there are still a lot out there. So please take note that uh, they do need to be um, converted to large span. And I'll show you in a minute how you do that. It is a very straightforward process. So the, um, the phase out is, gonna be, is a really long process. We started it in 2004 by introducing large span files. Uh, in 2008, we, we changed it to the default creation mode. Um, in 2011, we announced in the release notes and other places that 13.0 would be the last version to fully support them. And in 2014, next year, if you try and use 14.0 with a small span file, you will only be able to read it. You won't be able to write it. Now, we will maintain that support for at least 20, another 10 years, a total of 20 years from start to finish. Um, so that if you recover any component files from backups or whatever, you can access them still. But what you need to do with that readable 30, uh, small span component file is convert it to a large span file. So 13.2 and earlier, you try and tie a file, it's 32-bit or small span. It works, nothing surprising there. If you try doing that in 14.0, uh, this is what's going to happen. You're, you're going to get an access, a file access error and a, a message telling you what the problem is, which is that it's a small span file and you must tie it read-only, which is why, of course, we had that variant option just now. Now, the reason we do that and not just make it read-only is because uh, if you wanted to catch these errors, this is the place to do it uh, when you tie the file. Uh, if, if you tied the file and all of a sudden you couldn't write to it, we think that would probably cause you much greater problem in your application. So we, d we catch it here. And so now you tie it read-only. You can tie it, you can read it, but as you can see, you can't write to it. So, if you've got any of these small span files um, still, uh, what do you do? Uh, well, the first thing, I suppose, is to check whether they are small span or not. And if you uh, do quad f props on them, um, property s, that's the size, which is either going to be 32 or 64. 32 is what you don't want to see. Um, but quad f copy always creates a large span file. So if you copy your file, it will become large span, and you can continue working. Um, there is a user command, uh, f to 64. Well, that is the 13.2 name of it. It's changed in 14.0. Um, it, you give it a directory. You can ask it to go recursively down a directory if you wish. It will find all the small span files. It will automatically convert them for you. And then there'll be large span. And if you wish, it will keep backups of the originals. That is in 13.2. Um, if you haven't already, it would be useful to, to start doing that now. So. 
Having shown that, let's show what we've added as, being, as part of being able to reduce our support for small span files. The first thing we've done, and I guess the main thing we've done in this release, is, is we've really gone for performance. Um, the, f the main thing, I guess, is that we've re-implemented the way that we read and write to component files. Uh, we use um, more memory at the moment during the course of a write to reduce the amount of file system reads and writes, which can really slow an application down. So with this change, you don't need to make any uh, changes to your application. It should just work a lot faster than it did before. Um, how much faster it works depends on a number of factors. It works better on a fast network than a slow. Um, that's because with a slow network, the traffic, um, it basically that takes so long that any gain gets lost in the noise. Uh, but conversely, and perhaps you know, contradictory to what I just said, we also found from experimentation that a very congested network also gets huge gains from this. Um, and in particular, it works best with arrays that have got many small elements because they're the ones that resulted in many small writes to the file. So, um, in version 14, uh, sorry, before version 14, if you wanted to read uh, several components at once, you could. Um, there's an example of reading components 4, 6, and 8 um, all in one shot. You get a result with the three different components in it. Uh, in 14.0, you can do that in one shot like that. Now, that is perhaps a convenient syntax, but that's not the main purpose of it. The main purpose is to prevent uh, those separate F reads. In the first example, F read is invoked three times. Three times the file gets locked. Three times the file gets read through all the indices. And the result is constructed as a result of the each running. In the second example, the file is only locked once. And on some operating systems, with some file systems, locking is a very expensive process. Um, and it's worth doing. So there is a, um, I would say there's semantic difference. Now that's, there's a difference between uh, quad F read one one and then quad F read one two, where you do separate reads, and when you use this syntax, where you have to read the results into, to get a single result. Um, but it's it's worth it in many cases. You get a huge performance gain. So if you want to make use of this, you may have to make some application changes. And in a minute, I'll show you the kind of thing you might get as a result of doing it. Now. This one, when we experimented, we find that it's, it gives uh, best results with share tied files. That's, I guess, pretty obvious because uh, share tied files get locked between each operation. Exclusively tied files are already locked for your exclusive access. So uh, there's virtually no gain with an exclusive tie. Um, but there are huge gains with NFS file systems because that's where the uh, expensive file locking is. Um, it doesn't, it's not bad on others, but when you see NFS file systems, you will realize how, how bad locking is on those systems. And the third feature we've got for uh, performance is compression. So this, again, very much depends on your environment as to whether this is going to give you any advantage. Uh, we are going to, if we do compression, we, t we take a hit in processing to compress the data. But if we've got a slow file system, the smaller data gives real benefits. If we've got a very fast file system and a slow overloaded computer, it will actually make things worse. So you need to measure this and see whether it's useful to you. But it's very straightforward to use. We've got a new, new property on the file, Z, for zip. Um, you, can, you can set that using quad F props. It's another thing that you can set when you create a file. Um, and when you set that, thereafter, all components are automatically compressed. And any compressed components on a file are automatically decompressed. So there's nothing you need to do to use this apart from to set the property. The only disadvantage is that in 13.2 and earlier, they won't be able to read these compressed components. So you need to bear that in mind. Now, as I said, this really gives you performance benefits on slow networks when the cost of transferring that data is high, so then you're transferring less data. So I was going to give you some analysis of the kind of things you might get as a result of these performance gains that we've or performance work that we've done. Uh, 
I'm kind of, I've, I've got to do it. You want to know what it is. I've been told I've got to do it. But it's, it depends on so many different factors. All I can do is give you some examples. Uh, the kind of things that will uh, affect it are the, the type of data that you're using, but mostly the kind of operating system, load, processor speed, network speed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a load of examples. And you'll see the kind of thing you get on different platforms. Um, and in this example, I've basically what I did, I created a component file. I put uh, some data into a 1,000 components. It was actually the same data, but it's in a 1,000 different places. Um, it's a 100 by 4 matrix containing numbers and characters. It, it looked like something you might get out of a, a database. Um, and each one of those components was 12 kilobytes each. Um, and then I wrote the same data to components 1,001 and component, uh, to, to 2,000, another 1,000 components. Um, and this data is compressed quite well. They went down to 3 kilobytes each. Well, having done that, this, looks, this is far more, <laughs> looks far more complicated than it is. So at the top row, in 13.2, I read the first 1,000 uncompressed components, and I timed them. Um, and then uh, in the second row, I'm going to show you the results of, of reading those in in 14.0. So this is 13.2 is your base figure. 14, the second row down will show you what happens. Hang on, I've got a pointer here. Yep, that will, that will get a time there for doing the same thing in 14.0. That's, that's completely no changes required by the user. It, if that gets faster, you get it for free. Um, and from there, uh, we, if you change your code to use the multiple f read. Um, here I'll do some timings where I read them all as a single in a single go. Uh, we'll see how what effect that has. Or alternatively, we could try compressing and see what effect that has. And at the very bottom, we'll try both things at once. We'll compress, we'll read them all in one go. So in the following pages, I will sh I'll put some actual times in these boxes. So let's see what we've got. Uh, I did, first of all, I did Windows. There's going to be Windows examples, Linux examples, AIX examples, and there's going to be generally local file systems and remote file systems of varying different capacities. So in the first example, excuse me while I look around, um, 0.16 seconds is how long it took to read those 1,000 components uh, that were not compressed, so it just read them straight into the workspace, and that's 13.2. Um, when I switched to 14.0, uh, that went up to 0.1 second. So I got a 37% gain simply by switching to 14.0. Now, I must stress, you can't, that's not necessarily going to happen for every component type. It, it very much depends on what's in them. Um, it also depends on the performance of the machine. But it's an example. Um, when I then read the 1,000 components in one, reading using the new syntax, uh, I got a further imp performance improvement. I'm now up to nearly 50% improvement. Uh, but you'll see that when I tried uh, reading the compressed components and having them automatically uncompressed, things got worse. So we don't want to be using that in this example. And then again, when I do both, I don't get as good as I got with just multiple read. So that's good. But 48% is fantastic. You, you may see that, you may not, but it gives an example. So let's try the next one. Uh, I then went, I stayed on Windows, but I went over the network. Um, they're not massively different, these results. Uh, it's slightly slower to start with. It's got 38% faster just by switching to 14.0. Um, it's got 57% faster by reading the 1,000 components at once rather than individually. Um, but compression has got slower. And therefore, the combination of multiple components and compression is also slower than just the multiple reads. OK. Um, right, now I got Jason to set me up a slow network. This, this network was one megabit per second. And as you can see, <laughs> it just it went from, where were we before? How do I go backwards? 0.21 seconds to read all those components up to 100 seconds. So that pretty much dominated everything. So all the improvements in 14.0 just made no difference. They're lost in the noise. So it's still 100 seconds. It's still 100 seconds if I read all the components at once. But look what happens when I compress them. They compress 75% and the time's gone down 75% as well. 
and therefore the combination of multiple read and compression is also down 25, uh, 75%. That's, that is quite a slow network, but it, it probably represents uh, a loaded network, long distance network. Uh, Linux, similar, not quite so impressive to start with, goes down 17%, goes down 23%, so you're nearly down 25% just by, but by using those two new features, um, and compression in this case made no difference at all. The, the, the lack of, um, the, the, the removal of the uh, data transfer was, was overshadowed by the decompression. So Linux on a fast network, well, the thing that you notice about this uh, is, is that figure there. But be before we start, I should say that th three seconds on a fast network compared to 0 0.17 seconds on a local file system. That uh, is a much higher starting point, and that is the file locking on, on an NFS remote file system. Uh, if, you, if you take nothing from this, uh, you will get that same saving if you don't have an ex a share tie on your file. If you get an exclusive tie, you'll get that same saving. And if you don't need to share tie the files, don't, because I could not, <laughs> I was amazed when I saw that. So. But backing up again, 13.2 down to 14.0 sped up very, very slightly. Um, but then when, uh, and it's, it's a low percentage because it's on a high starting point. But when you got rid of all that file locking, that had a huge imp uh, improvement. Now that was a thousand components at a time, which is probably not going to be done in the real world. But I did this to kind of exaggerate the effect and, sh and show what it had. Um, compression again uh, had did in this case have a little bit of a difference. So when you combine those two things together, you're down to 5% of your original time to read those 1,000 components. AIX is here as well. This, um, this shows very similar results to, to Linux in both cases. So relatively fast uh, to start, goes down 26% just by moving to 14.0, can go down still further if you use multiple reads. Um, goes up in this case if you use compression, so you don't want to be doing that. Uh, whether it does or not depends on the network and the processor speed and the load, but overall uh, the combination of compression and multiple read is not as good as multiple read on its own. And the final one I've got is AX on a fast network which suffers in exactly the same way as Linux from file locking, so you get a 47% improvement just by switching you get down to 80% improvement by using multiple read, and uh, you get a further improvement by using compression. So you're down to 15% of where you started if you use everything that we've offered in 14.0. Right, yes, so that figure in particular is exaggerated. There's a thousand components. Um, if you've got a thousand components you can read at once, great, but I imagine that in most cases it would be fewer. So I'm showing you figures like 85 and 95 percent improvement. They are probably better than you would expect, um, but suffice to say this work was done as a result of a, a customer requirement, and in the real world example we were getting that kind of result. Uh, there we saw um, a, a time from reduced from 50 seconds to 5 seconds to read a load of components over a network. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to do is show you some 13.2 things. So I'm creating here a small span file. We're going back to the small span file issue. Really, the point of this is just to show you, um, you know, why you, you didn't want to be using them regardless of what we do in 14.0. So I've created a, 30, uh, a small span file by putting 32 at the end of the uh, the, the Quad F create. Um, if I check the properties, I can see that it's at the size is set to 32, um, and I can write data to it. That's great. Um, but if I try and write that data to it, and I apologise to anyone in the room, that according to Google, that says "Hello World" in Russian. I'd <laughs> Good, it does. <laughs> I had a horrible feeling I was going to be saying something horrendous. <laughs> and get marched out or something. <laughs> um, yeah, but I can't write that to the file, which is rather unfortunate. The reason, of course, is there's characters there that are not in quad, in quad AV. Um, and I can see that if I look at the Unicode property on the file, it's set to zero. So I'll set the Unicode property, and um, it won't let me, because it's not something I can do with a small span file. Those don't have the capability of it. So uh, in frustration, I will copy it 
to another file. Um, so now file two is my 64-bit file, which I can show by checking the S property. Um, I can now set the Unicode property, and I can write my data, and I'm happy again. This is the uh, user command, which will convert a whole bunch of files. Um, it's very straightforward to use. There are some options. The verbose option there is to uh, show me what it's doing. Uh, as I think I said earlier, you can get it to keep backups. You can get it to scan down entire directories. Uh, these files are in cconf. Um, it's converted my initial one, cf, to 64 bits. The CF64 was on my previous copy, so it hasn't done anything with that. There's another file for later in there as well, which it didn't need to touch. So my original file was that one. Um, I can see now it's become 64-bit. I can set the Unicode property. I can write my data to it. And I can read those two components. And they've got the data in that I expected to have. OK, so while I'm 13.2, I'm just going to create another 32-bit file because there's none left at the moment. I'm writing a single component to it, and that's all I'm going to do in 13.2. So here we are in 14.0. Um, if I try and create a 32-bit file now, well, as you know, we don't support that anymore. So that gives us an error. Um, I can tie the file if I give the option to, read on, to make it read-only. Um, I can read from it, so that's, I'm not going to lose any of my data. I can not write to it, but I can still copy it. So there's my way forward. I can create 64-bit files. And of course, I can use the user commands as well. Now that I've got my copy, I can write to that, so I can carry on as I was before. So here's an example of the syntax of multi-component reads. So that's the old syntax. Uh, this is the new syntax. You may prefer that anyway, um, and that just proves it does exactly the same thing. And here we go with compression. So this is uh, something that's going to compress extraordinarily well, as you can see. <laughs> if I do its quad size, it's it's that big, 10,000 10, bytes or so. Uh, so I've got this component file with two components in it. I'll, I'll put the, put this in the first one. You can see that its size on the disk is, is just slightly larger for the uh, serialization overhead and component headers and so on. Um, now, if I set the component file property to Z to 1, um, and I will now write to component 2, um, if I look at the size of that, it's gone down to 276. But if I read it back, it automatically decompresses it. I get back what I started with. Now, I've got a little diversion here, but I haven't got much time. OK, I'll do it. Um, right, I have got a component file here, which has got on it uh, some text data. Uh, if I, I've read it in, if I have a look at it, you can see it's a piece of well-known text. Uh, it's got 1,488 characters and other bits in it. Uh, unsurprisingly, if I do the size of the quad UCS of it, it's also 1,488 elements long. Uh, if I look at those, the first 50 of them, they're numbers. These are the kind of things I like to compress. So we've written all these compression algorithms um, for component files. We've, we've put in an I-beam to make them available as well. Um, now, I should stress at this stage that this may not be what ends up in 14.0, but it's probably going to be this. We've implemented the LZ4 compression algorithm. We've also implemented gzip, as you'll see in a minute. Um, and so 219 iBeam, which if you kind of look at it sideways, looks a bit like zip, uh, <laughs> allows you to compress that data. One means uh, LZ4. Uh, where are we? So if I compress that text, which was 1,488 characters before, it's now 1277. That's not bad. It's not great. Um, it's 15%, less than 15% of a reduction. So let's try gzip. Uh, that's two on the left argument. That's, that's rather better. That's give me a 44% reduction in size. Um, and I can unzip this thing automatically. So here we go. We take the text, we turn it to numbers, we zip it, we unzip it, and we, we turn it back into characters. And, well, unsurprisingly, when I delete that, we get our original, that's true, we get our original text back. Now, we are using LZ4, which I've just shown you, it did not give the best compression, um, but it's very much faster. 
So at the moment, our experiments suggest that LZ4 is the best to use. We're probably going to stick with that. We may, we may make it configurable, but at the moment, that's what we're doing. It's still a work in progress. OK, Before possibilities for the future. Well, no promises for any of these. I kind of hoping that people will give feedback because they may, may you know, affect what happens. So I showed you that we had um, quad F read that read multiple components at the time. The logical extension of that is to allow you to read from multiple files at the same time. It's a logical extension, but it's a, an odd thing to do because we're going to have to lock multiple files at once. And in fact, it will probably kill performance rather than improve it. So although it's on the list to investigate, I have no idea at this stage whether it will be done. And either we've only done F read as well because you generally read more than you write. It was the, the Im biggest immediate gain, but of course, writing it, doing it with uh, write and append is also uh, something we should consider. Um, there's a problem with we haven't been able to work out a syntax for some of those because of the way the numbers work, but we, w we will look at that in the next releases. Um, now, Asynchronous reads and writes is something we've been asked for for a long time, and this is something we can now look at as a result of the change we made in 14.0 that just makes things faster. We, when we write, we prepare all the data we're going to send, and we send it out to the file system, and then we sit and wait for the file system function to return and say the file's gone. Um, in that time, we could be doing other things. Um, well, we could be doing other things, but if that gave an error, we wouldn't want that to happen sort of later on in our APL program, so that wouldn't be very good. But if we've got a threaded APL application, there's no reason now why that shouldn't be a point where we thread switch and let the other threads at least continue while we wait for the data to go out to the disk. So that's something we're going to look at. Uh, the same thing happens on writes and reads. Uh, encryption. We've talked about a lot internally. We haven't got any... Uh, firm plans on it, but we've shown you compression, and, and it would be similar to that. You would be able to somehow specify your key. The individual component within the file could get compressed, uh, to get encrypted. It wouldn't be an entire file encryption, but the, we could certainly encrypt components. A lot more work to be done. Again, we'd be very keen to hear whether people think that's a good thing or not. Uh, an even more contentious one within our group is whether we really strongly encourage people to have all files journaled and checksummed, because uh, non-journaled and checksummed files can be broken quite easily. But on the other hand, some people don't care. It might be a temporary file, and they're faster. So very much appreciate any feedback on whether you think uh, that you would suffer from the result of not having those available. And the final one I wanted to show you a little bit more detail about is transactions. And again, this is kind of shooting some ideas. But what I mean by transition is something like that code there. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm moving a, a component from one file to another. And if I was to interrupt the APL uh, between the append and the drop, I would end up with a file with the data in two places. Um, which is not good. So that should be considered a logical unit. Uh, and, the, and that's what we mean by a transaction. Wouldn't it be good if that all happened or it, none of it happened? And if you were to interrupt it halfway through, the data didn't get onto the, the second file. Well, um, supposing it looked a bit like that, that's just a thought. It's not anything we've definitely decided on. But we've used Variant to say that this version, this implementation of Quad F Hold defines a transaction. And we, when we hold, as usual, we define the beginning of the transaction. When we release the holds at the end, we commit the change. And if for any reason that should implicitly be released, that hold, we will roll back any changes that happened. Or perhaps we could explicitly roll them back with a syntax like that. So I quick quickly summary of what I've done before questions. Um, we talked about how good large span files were, how bad small span files were, and why we're getting rid of them. Um, I very briefly talked about journaling and checksumming, uh, data compatibility to prevent workspace corruption, extended error reporting, all things that happened prior to 14.0, so are available to you now. Uh, we've got support for uh, variant on a number of things. 
We've done a lot of performance improvements, and we're thinking about more performance improvements, encryption, and transactions. And that's the end, so I would welcome any questions. <laughs> Do we have any? Oh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> please, uh, implementing transactions. Yes. Uh, take care of the, the, the code F old, uh, yes. who was a very nice uh, staff uh, long ago, is a, a, a bit uh, difficult to use uh, in uh, a multi-traded environment. Right. Uh, because you don't know if some other thread will do another code F old, destroying the first one that you are trying to do. So well, each code F old needs to be protected by trade switching. Right. If you yes. can take care of that from the very beginning, it will be better. Jeff is on your side on that. He, he keeps saying to me, we must sort this out. So <laughs> um, he is twisting my arm on your behalf on that one. <laughs> yes, Dan. Do you anticipate any issues as we go to 64-bit machines? So I have an application that's running fine on a 32-bit machine that's accessing a component file. I now move to a 64-bit machine accessing that same component file. Um, not as a result of anything to do with component files, because there, there is no link between the, the bit size of the interpreter and the, and the files themselves. They're all completely interchangeable. So 64-bit works just as well as 32-bit, and vice versa, with either 32 or 64-bit files. Um, the only thing you should bear in mind, I guess, is that if you've got a lot of data that's in a small span that was written by a 32-bit <coughs> Uh, interpreter, and now you start reading it into a 64-bit interpreter, it gets converted um, on read to 64-bit internal format. So you may want to, m to go through updating your component files at the same time as upgrading your interpreter. Yes? Um, you've got a, a very nice extension of uh, multiple component reads um, from the same file. Yes. Do you foresee a time when we might be able to do um, the same component from multiple files? Uh, I know you've got the locking problem. Yes, or um, not necessarily the same component, but you know, component one from file one yeah. and component yeah. two from file two. Yes, this was one of the possible extensions for the future. Um, it, but as you just alluded, it does have the problem that you've got to lock both files and then you've got the issues if you can only get one lock. The, the problems that we deal with in Quad F hold. And therefore, um, not having yet experimented with it, I suspect that that will kill any performance benefits. It may be a convenient syntax and may still be worth doing um, as a logical extension of what we've already done. But as yet, I don't I don't know how well it will give you a performance improvement. Jay? Um, it sounds to me like designing transactions when you're reading writing multiple files is, it sounds like quite a hard thing to get right. So I was wondering, is there any value in implementing the idea of transactions, but just to start with having the limitation that it only works for a single file? Is that something useful to say, you can read these components and then write these ones and have all of that as a single transaction? Um, yes, uh, that could be done. Um, I think in most cases it would be more useful if it was supporting multiple files. And I don't think we'd want to put it out without doing that. Um, now, only between you and me, Jay, so everybody else cover your ears, much of the work we need for support transactions is already in the interpreter, so um, as part of the DFS work that we've done. I'll keep that quiet. So, yes, don't, t don't tell anybody else. Um, so, so yes, it would require a lot more to do, but it's not necessarily as difficult to do multiple files than the single file. Stefan. Given that I've heard this corridor rumor that you're nearing the completion of transactions, um, what I'm curious about is um, y you've presented transactions as a way to um, obtain consistency uh, for a certain set of operations. Yes. Um, given that I'm also very interested in performance, um, a transaction could be seen uh, 
as a as an atomic operation, even from the point of view of the locks. Uh, yes, in the sense that I suspect that uh, I don't have the proof. Um, right now, if you quote a fault something and then you do a sequence of quote a read quote f replace, uh, you're still getting uh, every lock. Yeah, you must get the well, uh, the component lock. Well, we've got because quote a fold is um, how to say is something you opt in. Yes, but, but not necessarily to in, to different processes will quad f hold before doing a certain operation on a file. No, but a, but a quad f hold does exactly the same kind of lock on a different region of the file to the lock that we get when we do yeah, an update. What I'm saying is that um, you can use quad f hold to obtain a transactional consistency, well, yes. almost transactional consistency, as long as nothing crashes between two processes. But each one, it, the process which does the multiple reads and writes, is mm. still taking uh, the single uh, component locks. Well, um, I'm, it's interesting. I know this code back to front. However, I'm, I think you're right. And I also well, think, well, that's, must, I think that's unnecessary. Because if you've got a hole, oh no, it's there no, because, no, because they're, they're not See. mandatory, are they? Yes. No. So you're right. So yes, we do still take them. Whereas it would be nice uh, if you could, under a single hold, uh, yeah. a real hold, yes. I mean file hold, uh, yeah. um, make it a mandatory ob lock. obtain uh, yeah. a, a sequence of read and write. Sorry. Because it took me a while to catch up, but you're absolutely right. As you've prov proven, yeah. in certain cases, locks kill performance. Yes. Uh, and it's uh, if you're building a uh, a more complex structure out of a component file, yeah. it's quite rare that a single read uh, followed by a, s I mean, a single read is enough. Yeah. Um, for instance, you might be reading uh, a directory and use that directory to know where you need to write something uh, yeah. or uh, replace something, which is another read, yeah. and then it replace. And each one of these operations requires a lock and an unlock. Yes, and uh, you're right. It, it would be nice, even if you don't do the entire transaction thingy, yeah. to have a way to say, okay. get a lock from here on, you don't get any more lock. Yeah. That, mm, I don't know what most of the file is locked well, anyway. It's a good point. Uh, I, should, I should have said as we went through that this multi-component read is really antisocial because you get a lock for as long as it takes to read all of those components. And I guess the same thing would apply there. But it's certainly something we should look at. And I'll also point out, uh, pick up on one thing you said. Uh, the transaction wouldn't work uh, if there was a crash. Uh, it, it should do. It's, it's been designed in such a way that uh, it would still work. Okay. Back. okay, so thank you, Richard. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>